You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. James Beecham. Dr. Beecham is a particle physicist, science storyteller, and filmmaker. He's currently a full-time researcher working on the Large Hadron Collider, currently with the Atlas Group of Duke University, based full-time at CERN. He received his PhD at New York University, and before that attended UC Santa Cruz, where he completed a double major in physics and math. His research focuses on searches for new particles and phenomena such as dark matter, dark photons, quantum black holes, and exotic Higgs bosons. He also advocates for future physics experiments such as larger colliders to address the biggest open questions in science. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Dr. James Beecham, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much. Disassembling Mercury and building a giant Big Bang machine on the moon. It would be very helpful for the IAU definition that demoted Pluto if Mercury wasn't there. So I support the effort <laughs> or the reinstatement of Pluto for that matter. Well, that's in fact something that Constantine joked about in, in our email thread. He's like, oh, I, and by the way, I, I think that I'm totally on board with dismantling Mercury. I never thought that the demotion of Pluto went far enough. So. <laughs> yes, let's really demote something. <laughs> And build a particle accelerator the size of the solar system. Now, using the moon for science, which I agree with you, is of the utmost importance because I, it's not that useful <laughs> for mining unless you're building O'Neill cylinders or something like that. Right. But the fact of the matter is I don't want to change what we see. <laughs> well, you know, I want the moon to look exactly the way it does right now in a million years from our perspective for our future humans to see the moon the way that we've always seen it. Right. And it's sort of an interesting idea that preserve the moon, preserve the moon. Yeah. But a particle accelerator, we're probably not going to see that <laughs> from this distance. Wouldn't you think? That's I mean, a good point. You know, I, was, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. Feel free. Keep going. No, I'm good. Go. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, that's an extremely good point. And of course, for me, you know, that's that's something that, in fact, we talk about in the paper and that I also, you know, emphasize very strongly in my, you know, in my science storytelling and my communications and talking to non-specialists is that like, you know, I, I'm, I'm also an artist. I have an artistic uh, practice myself and I'm a poet and, you know, like I understand the importance of having the moon the way it is, right? I mean, you would basically ruin poetry for centuries or maybe change poetry if you were to change the visual look of the moon. So the, there's, there's good and bad news for the prospect of building an 11,000 kilometer circumference particle collider somewhere on the moon. The good news is that as we talk about at length in the paper, it's probably uh, uh, among the very of the among the different uh, options for building such an enormous collider on the moon. The best one, in fact, is to dig into under the surface of the moon, maybe two or two or three hundred meters below, and then build tunnels, dig tunnels that are uh, that are all the way around the moon. This is better for a few reasons. The, the other option, of course, you might think, okay, well, digging tunnels is quite expensive. Why don't you just do it on the surface? There are a few things against that. These sort of day-night temperature variations on the surface of the moon are quite high, which would make it so that it's basically impossible to use superconducting magnets for the full amount of time that you would want or for any amount of time because there's always going to be some part of the, the moon that's in, that's in the sun. And so that ends up not being a very good idea or it ends up being a drawback. The other drawback about doing something on the surface is that even though they are quite, you know, the big ones are quite rare, you still do have tiny uh, meteorite strikes that happen all the time. There's no atmosphere, of course, on the, on the moon and so, or at least a negligible atmosphere. And so you still get some decent sized strikes that will hit. And eventually one of those might be large enough to, you know, damage some equipment. And that's, that's kind of a, a pain in the neck. So there's a few drawbacks for doing that, uh, to, to doing that. And it turns out that digging under the surface of the moon is probably the best way to go. So no, you would not see that. And in fact, it turns out probably the best topographically, we, we didn't do this, we, you know, we didn't do an extensive study, but the the sort of first principles of the first order topological study that we did of the moon, you know, using the, the lunar maps that we have, it turns out that probably the best place to dig this tunnel would in fact be around a circle that's more or less the circle that is always facing the earth, if that makes sense. So like, as you know, the moon and the earth are tidally locked. We always see the same side of the, of the, of the moon. And so this, if 
you just trace a circle around that, that's basically, it's probably the best way because it avoids a lot of the, the very, uh, it avoids a, a large number of the huge craters and the, the mare that they have. Not all of them. And so there's some interesting, uh, there's some in, in, interesting engineering challenges that you might have to face. So for example, even going few, a few hundred meters under the surface of the moon, if you have this tunnel that goes around this 11,000 kilometers in circumference, there's still, most of the time, it's actually within rock and, and stuff. But there will be some times when it will start to empty into an enormous, uh, into an enormous mare. And if that's the case, then what do you do? Do you have, like, do you build some sort of tube that is, you know, like a, an LHC style, these blue tubes, you know, to encase the beam? And you have to build this somehow, you know, 5,000 meters above the surface of this enormous crater. It turns out, though, that, for example, the, the you, you probably don't need to have an entirely covered beam the entire time. The Large Hadron Collider itself, right? I say it's a circular tunnel, but it's not a perfect circle. You, you need parts of the full trajectory that are straight so you can collide things, for example, and then you need bendy sections. So you have some bendy sections. The bendy sections are the ones where you need the superconducting magnets to accelerate, you know, to, 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 bend, to bend the particle beam. But for the straight sections, you don't need anything, right? I mean, the beam will just go straight ahead. The problem you can't, the reason you need to cover it still on the earth is that you still have, you, there's no way for you to get a, a perfect vacuum on earth. However, the default vacuum on the surface of the moon, or even a few, you know, whatever, underneath the surface of the moon is way thousands of times better than the best vacuum that we have at the LHC. So in fact, you could just have this beam going into, into the, the emptiness of uh, space and be collected when it gets to the other side of the of the crater. Anyway, these are the kinds of engineering challenges that you have to think about when you build such a thing. So that being said, yes, you do, you know, in principle, the collider itself would not be visible from the moon. And, you know, if you wanted to, you could have the, you know, I, I think that, and again, I'm not the first person to talk about this, science fiction authors. And in fact, NASA has been talking about this since a very long time. This notion that you could use these lunar tunnel, uh, these lava tubes that are natural, they are natural craters that are made on, that are suspected to be made on to exist under the surface of the moon. You could have that be where most of the base, uh, the, 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 the bases could be built to house any, you know, uh, any personnel that needed to be there for any reasonable amount of time, etc. So you wouldn't have to see a lot of stuff from the earth that, you know, that be visible on the surface of the moon. However, one big problem, as the smart amongst you might be observing, is that how are you going to power such an enormous machine like this, right? Again, I think that your audience understands this, but I still get questions from people that don't really understand what the Large Hadron Collider is. We're not looking for energy sources. We're, you know, we're not trying to build military applications. Like, we, there's no way you could do anything with military with our work. Our work. And so, like, people think, oh, well, you know, so you're, you're creating all this energy. No, 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 we're not creating anything. We use a ton of electrical power to power this machine, <laughs> to make these discoveries and to, you know, to search for these discoveries. So you, we, of course, did the calculation in our paper for a circular collider on the moon. You would need a source that is, oh, I have to look at it again. It's some enormous source. It's something like, it's something like half of the, uh, half of the exist, uh, half of the, the energy consumption of humanity right now <laughs> to power a CCM. And so that's not going to be so easy to come by. And so, of course, we went through the possibilities of what would it take to, say, build a bunch of, you know, fission plants on the moon. And of course, you could do that, but it would take a very large number of them. And, you know, we, we would like to try to move away from uh, fission power as much as we can. What about fusion power? Number one, we don't have it yet. Uh, uh, but OK, in principle, you could do that, too. That would be nice. But then there's also a huge outlay for research and development. And also, you know, making sure that there's there's construction in situ and making sure that people are on hand to, you know, to, to operate, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, I think people will be less comfortable remotely operating, you know, a fusion plant or a series of fusion plants on the moon. But the one thing you do have copious, uh, you know, and abundant uh, on the moon is, of course, solar power. And we did the calculation that you would really, to power the CCM, you would need a panel, uh, you know, so you would need a little patch of solar panels with, you know, even I think 10 to 50% efficiency, something like that, a little patch of solar panels that's about the size of the state of Delaware. Okay, maybe that sounds large, but it's actually kind of, that's doable. Right? That's completely accessible for, for current uh, technology. However, the problem with having a little patch with Delaware is that, as we pointed out, that sometime is going to be in the, in the shade and you will not be able to collect solar power all the time. 
So then I thought, of course, and in fact, I was very proud of myself when I was thinking about this paper. I'm like, okay, well, wait, what about instead of having a little patch? Ah, wait a minute. Okay, so what about like a little belt? Like if we put a little belt around the moon of solar panels so that some of that is always going to be in the sun so you can continuously collect solar power. And I'm like, wow, great. I'm such a smart person to think about this. And then I thought, then I took a beat and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm guaranteeing somebody else thought about this already. And so I Googled around a bit and yes, lo and behold, there's a Japanese company that's already been working on this for, for a while. <laughs> and they, of course, the idea for this, uh, for this Japanese company came about at least partially inspired by the Fukushima Daiichi disaster and the desire to move away from, you know, fission, fission reactors. And so they thought that, you know, in fact, they had this entire idea to build a, a belt, you know, the lunar ring, they call it around the moon. And they have this way that you could beam some of this power back to collection stations in the ocean of the earth and then they could be used by humanity etc so of course this is my way of then addressing your question is that the solar panel belt uh, right around basically around the equator of the moon as we see it yeah that would be totally visible so that's a problem i'm not sure how you would solve that you'd have to maybe i don't, I don't know I, I think that you, either you'd have to find a, another source for this power. For example, you could imagine if this beaming, this power beaming technology is good enough, then you might imagine building some, you know, uh, like a kind of fleet of satellites that are near the moon that could also collect the solar panels, you know, like a Dyson sphere style thing, but little patches of Dyson sphere, which is really what a lunar belt would be around the, uh, around the moon. And then if these can collect power, then in principle, they could beam them both back to the earth and also to the moon. So maybe that's a way around. We did not investigate that in our paper, but I completely agree with you that I, I, I you know, even proposing a sort of lunar ring is going to get you in trouble with not just the poets of the world, but also just the, the moon appreciators of the world. Another form of detectability. When you create gigantic megastructure particle accelerators, with, for example, the Neptune orbit sized one, do you create a techno signature that an alien could see and what would our SETI scientists look for in the galaxy to see if anyone has done this or is it just too self-contained? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the problem with a particle collider is that from a galactic scale, uh, you know, it's still pretty, pretty modest, right? I mean, if you think about it, for a particle collider around even, like we said, we probably don't need a Neptune scale collider to get to the Planck energy. But let's say, you know, even if you wanted to build one just for fun, let's say you had a civilization that just, you know, had this capacity and they just thought, oh, this is a LARF, let's do this. So they decided to build this. You really don't need facilities and infrastructure that's anything larger than, you know, in, you know, in say cross-sectional uh, circumference than what the Large Hadron Collider is. Like, it's not as though the beam is going to be larger. It's not, protons are still tiny, right? It's not you know, having a, a beam of protons, you, you need to focus it so that the protons can actually collide. And this is still tiny, like at the Large Hadron Collider, right before, you know, as the beams circle around in opposite directions in the 27 kilometers, and then right before you bend them together and make them collide, they're, you know, as they're as they're circulated around or circulating around the circumference, the beam size is something like, I forget what it is, it's on the kind of millimeter size, millimeter to centimeter even, something like that. But then when you want them, that's, that's still not good enough to get them to collide. Right before they collide, you need to squeeze them and focus the beam. And so then you start to focus it down to about the width of a human hair. And so really what we're doing is we're kind of trying to collide two human hairs at 99.9999991% uh, of the speed of light. And so that's still the case you'd want to do something like that at an enormous collider. So the beam doesn't have to be that large and the facility doesn't have to be that large. So being able to see that from a, from a, a distant civilization is going to be very hard. So you know, like I said, it doesn't even have to be a, in, in fact, it, it would be very difficult to make a continuous circle around just past the orbit of Neptune, for example. You don't need to, you would have these kind of longer bendy sections and then a straight section where the, the beam would just go through outer space. And then it would be collected into another bendy section and it would get bent and then it would go straight. So you wouldn't even have a continuous circle that would make a very obvious, potentially detectable signature in terms of fluctuations or deviations from, you know, say starlight or, you know, sunlight in this case. So, I, you know, for a particle collider, it, I, I personally think, again, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's also a bad idea to sell short astronomers <laughs> to be able to see extremely weak things very far away. So I, I would never say it's 
it's impossible, but to be able to see evidence for an enormous particle collider somewhere on some other civilization is going to be tough. I, I, I think it's still possible, but it, you know, again, it doesn't even have to be a continuous circle. It's not a very large thing. Again, like I said, on galactic scales, if you have even several million kilometers long bendy section, but it's only about 10 meters in diameter uh, or in, in kind of cross-sectional width, that's going to be very difficult to see on galactic scales. But I think that in principle, the, the, probably the more likely thing to look for to see if this kind of a thing has been pursued by other civilizations somewhere else in the universe um, that may or may not exist is something that, of course, people have been talking about for a very long time, which is that you look for evidence of some kind of Dyson sphere. As you know, we've talked about this concept of the Dyson sphere before. And as you know, this classification of civilizations, one of the highest levels of a civilization is whether or not they're able to harness most or all of the free solar energy from the light energy and from their nearby star. Obviously, humanity is nowhere near that, but you would imagine that a civilization that has gotten to a higher level than ours would be able to do such a thing. And if that's the case, you could start to see modulations in a particular way. You'd start to, you know, as the, 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 the starlight from some distant star is modulated in a particular way that has a, that has a, a pattern behind it, right? Which is probably indication that there's either some kind of partial Dyson sphere or a series of Dyson panels or, or patches that are put together in, you know, hexagonal form, for example, with some spaces in between. Then, you you know, that in principle could be evidence of a civilization that has harnessed a lot of the, the free energy that they have. And of course, maybe they're using it for, you know, if they can do that, then they probably have also, <laughs> they have a more advanced particle physics program than we do. And it's likely that they've also built something like this. Or the thing that of course I am, I also have to be simultaneously optimistic for is that there will be other kinds of particle acceleration technologies that will be pursued that may enable us to reach much higher energies on much smaller scales, which would hopefully obviate the need to build circumsolar particle colliders. That's also a possibility that in fact, I think there's, it's interesting to talk about that in even a totally different episode, right? This notion of particle acceleration technology. It's like, why, if, if, like I said, if the next guaranteed discovery in collider physics is at the Planck scale, and in fact, there's a caveat to that, it might be about three orders of magnitude lower than that, which is the so-called gut scale, which is the grand unified theory, which is how, as you know, we, we know that back in the day, they thought electricity and magnetism were two different things. It turns out those are two parts of one force, electromagnetism. And then, of course, it turns out that electromagnetism and the weak force, if you go to high enough energies, these become one force, the electroweak. We assume that this is also the case with the strong force and electroweak. These would come together in a unified force. And it turns out that the kind of likely area for that, for it to be able to discover this particle collider would be about three orders of magnitude lower than the Planck scale. So if you build the Planck collider, you can also access that one too. <laughs> so you might ask the question, if these are the next guaranteed discoveries, then why hasn't the entire field, my entire field, why haven't we dropped everything and are working full time on acceleration technologies to be able to reach such a thing? I don't have the answer to that except for, you know, institutional inertia and the desire for people to protect their careers and to have incremental change so that they can, you know, uh, graduate grad students, blah, 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 which are totally noble goals. I completely support that. But really, from a scientific perspective, those are the next guaranteed discoveries. We need to put everything into disrupting existing technologies. And a lot of this acceleration technology is, is, that, it's, is that it's infancy or is still in its infancy. And I think that so much R&D can still be done. So that's, that's the kind of long way of saying that if there is another civilization out there, we would look probably to see if they have any notion of a Dyson sphere or some part of a Dyson sphere, which would be proof positive that they are well advanced beyond what we are. And also they probably have a much more advanced particle, uh, you know, a particle physics program than we do, including acceleration technologies <laughs> that would enable us to not have to build the solar system collider. As cool as it is, I, I would love to build, you know, I would love to be alive thousands of years from now when people start to build a, a collider around the, the orbit of Neptune, but uh, it's not so likely. The fine tuning problem within physics, we look at the universe and we see these values and we were like, well, what's set that on the particle level, the particle physics level? Is there anything that spooks you? In other words, why is the this value set this way and how did that happen? Does that come up with you? Yeah, for me, spook me? No. And I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, the, the notion is that this notion of the fine tuning problem or, you know, it's uh, or it goes by various names throughout physics. Um, 
And it is an interesting issue. I don't know if I would call it a problem so much, but it's an interesting issue. And for me, it's interesting because of the way that it actually really weirdly polarizes some physicists. (laughs) It's, you know, if you're just talking about from a purely scientific and intellectual perspective, it's a fascinating idea. And all of the possible ways that we could explain this are valid, right? So for example, the notion of uh, b- part of what you're getting at, right, is that like I, something that I touched upon earlier is that our universe seems to be filled with magic numbers, so-called magic numbers. These are values or constants of nature that are just put there and we have, and they're numbers, but we have no particular reason or explanation or mechanism for why those numbers are what they are. But if those numbers were actually even a little bit to a lot different, our universe would be a completely different place. So, for example, things that we've talked about here, like the Higgs field has this thing known as the vacuum expectation value. It's just a number. It's a, it, it's a, it's a number that more or less controls the sort of ability of this field to do its particular job that it does to give masses to certain kinds of particles in just the way that it does. And if this were a different value, we would have a very different universe than what we have now. But it's not just this Higgs vacuum vacuum expectation values, other things like the charge of the electron. Why is that number what it is? Or the the gravitational constant. Why is that number exactly what it is? And also the speed of light, right? This is also a strange thing. Like people talk about this sometimes as like, oh, speed of light is an upper limit on which, on what anything, you know, information or something can move in the universe. And that's true. But why? Why that number? Why is it not something like twice as what it is? What if it's, why is it not one half what it is? It is what it is, but you know, that's, that's hardly uh, satisfying to a true physicist, hardcore physicist. A physicist is the person who is always looking for the mechanism or the how and why behind the how and why. And in, in the absence of mechanisms to explain things that we observe in the universe, a physicist is extremely dissatisfied. <laughs> so for example, you know, if you, if, if a physicist asks you as a student, what causes X phenomenon? And you tell this physicist, well, that's just the way it is. She will be very dissatisfied with your answer. But kind of that's where we end up going with some of these constants of nature. You just see these numbers and one of the answers is, well, that's just the way it is. And it could be something different, but it's not. Well, that's hardly a satisfying answer for the true hardcore physicist. And so when you start thinking about what kind of mechanisms might lead to that, the thing that we observe you start to, you eventually you can, you, you, well, you start to think about, you know, okay, what are some real scientific or mathematical principles that I could use to apply to this? Yeah. To this problem. Okay. Physically, there's not so much we can do because number one, we don't know what happened before the big bang. We don't even know how to well formulate that question. In fact, those that study time and the nature of time, and in fact, quantum mechanics, as you know, people like, uh, like Hawking and, 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 uh, some more sort of outlandish ideas, you know, like, uh, Carlo Rovelli and things like this, there might not even be anything before the big bang. The concept of before breaks down when you start to get toward these extremely small time scales. And in fact, there might not be a before the big bang. So we don't know how to formulate this question so much from the first principles physics perspective. So instead, what about using a different tool that we have as scientists and thinkers? You can think about mathematical tools. Okay. So mathematics and statistics. So we know that the universe loves statistics and the world loves statistical distributions, in fact. So, you know, for example, the the resting heart rate of everyone listening to this, if we were to put it into a bin, it would follow a nice Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. And if you go and stand on a street corner, the rate at which cars will pass you will follow some kind of Poisson distribution, things like that. So in a lot of cases, you know, if you, uh, uh, you know, with a lot of statistical arguments, you can also dial dial things up and down and you have a lot of handles. But really, it's actually quite remarkable that the, the universe, a lot of it can be described by statistics by statistical distributions. So you start thinking, okay, well, maybe the universe, there's something behind the scenes in the universe. The universe is not just this one contiguous object that you and I exist in. For example, we know for a fact that the universe, there, there's two different things we have to think of when we talk about the universe, quote unquote. First, we have to distinguish between the entire universe and the observable universe, right? We know that the observable universe is a sphere centered on you that contains all of the stuff in the universe that has had time to send a light signal that has been received by us now. But we know that there has to be more than that outside of the observable universe. And so the size of the entire universe is in fact unknown. As you know, it may be infinite. It might be something enormously large. And we don't know what's beyond that. So the concept of what the universe is and is not starts to get a little bit vague there. So you start to think, okay, well, what if 
one way that we could have a mechanism by which we see and observe the specific constants of nature that we see in our universe is that in fact these constants of nature are actually nothing special they are special to us because if they like i said if they were a little bit different our universe would be a very different place you know for example if like this higgs vev or or if the higgs vev were different or the higgs boson mass were different in the early universe if you had an electron with a zero mass and in fact you could postulate a universe with electrons that still exist but they have a zero mass if a uni- if electron had zero mass then atoms would never have formed in the early, early universe and if atoms never formed you and i would not be here to have this conversation so it's a good thing that these values are what they are but you but again the values themselves the numerical values are nothing special so you start thinking okay maybe these values are not special and in fact maybe these values that we have are just one combination of these values that can be taken out of a large statistical statistical distribution of say Higgs boson masses or electron charges or something like that and each one of these possible combinations does in fact take place somewhere in some other quote unquote other universe in dun 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 the multiverse right and of course when we talk about the multiverse concept it is not the slovenly lazy storytelling mechanism that basically every movie and every silly movie likes to take advantage of now because it just allows you to do anything without explanation whatsoever that's not what we're talking about we're talking about a very specific thing which is that we have to re conceptualize what we mean by the universe which in fact our conception of space time and the way it the way that it quote unquote expands must be extended to incorporate other possibility for example bubble universes within a multiverse landscape where the other constants of nature took other values <laughs> and if that's the case then we immediately have our mechanism it turns out that ours is from one perspective nothing special and the fact that these are just a bunch of numbers taken from a statistical distribution but it also means that ours our special because there's at least one of those that had to lead to this combination that we observe now so that's that's fascinating it's a totally fascinating idea and in fact it totally comes from science it's a it's a scientific idea because we started from first principles scientific things that we observe about the universe and we arrived at we followed the logical syllogism we arrived at this possibility so am i saying that we live in a universe no i am uh, sorry in a multiverse no i am not saying that <laughs> that's the important part and that's why i think that why i started this kind of this segment saying that one of the most interesting things about the fine tuning quote unquote fine tuning problem is the weird way that it polarizes some physicists because you do get some physicists or maybe former physicists who like to say the the multiverse idea is non-scientific and if you're talking about this it's non-scientific because it's not testable well it's not testable right now but that doesn't that's not the only criteria by which something is judged as being scientific or not in this case i think that the multiverse idea again i don't think of it as something special i don't think of it as something mysterious or and it's definitely not offensive it's just a fantastically weird and interesting possible mechanism by which we could explain this fine tuning issue the of course the kicker is that again like we said before two things can simultaneously be true the multiverse idea is a fascinating idea and it is based upon a scientific reasoning but it's also simultaneously not testable at the moment those two things can be true at the same time i don't so I, i part of me is like i don't understand and, and as you can tell i've been i've been you know uh, I, a lot of us have been affected by conversations that we've had with these people that the, you know these physicists that don't really fully understand what it is they're saying when they when they make this very bold statement that the multiverse idea is uh, is non-scientific it just doesn't make any sense it's okay to have two things true at the same time number one that this is an interesting idea number two that it's not testable at the moment for me i would never be so you know vain or egotistical to think that humanity or cynical in fact to think that humanity would never come up with a way to test this idea in the future but yeah it's true that right now it's not 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 such a testable idea so yeah you know i i think that this fine tuning issue the fine tuning problem is a fascinating unanswered question right now and i think there are some interesting ways to potentially explain that but the thing we're lacking right now of course is a is a you know sort of definitive and even clear a well defined way to test that idea there has been some interesting things though as far as testing that for example cold spots in the cmb were were suggested right. that maybe <laughs> maybe this universe had a fender bender with another what's your thoughts on that 
Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, when I say that there's no clear or good way to test it right now, what I mean is there's no sort of like magic bullet way, you know what I mean? Like some perfect experiment, the ideal experiment you could come up with to disambiguate between the two possibilities, right? So as you point out, yes. And I, in fact, I, 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 I very much love these, uh, this research that is done where astronomers look at the CMB, they look at the cosmic microwave background and they start to apply different, different sorts of radiation patterns on it and start to look for different types of correlations on different scales and start to think that maybe there, you know, if you look at it just right, there are some, there are some little bumps and spots here. And so, yeah, you know, that, I think that's just fascinating. And, I, and I, I love to think about this too, speculate about the fact that the great cold spot, right, as you pointed out in the CMB, if you look, squint in just the right way, you can convince, not convince you, but you can, you can conclude that perhaps this is, this could be the evidence of two universes that evolved or that, that, that expanded, inflated, right, quote unquote, next to each other in this extended space time, which I also have a hard time wrapping my head around. <laughs> where, you know, where did this collision happen? What does that quote unquote mean? <laughs> but, you know, yes. Okay. I think that's an interesting idea that maybe this could be evidence of, of a kind of bubble collision of two different universes inflating. However, if you think about that, that, what I mean by not being a perfect experiment or a perfect kind of perfectly disambiguated experiment, even if we were to convince ourselves that that is a statistically significant cold spot, that's not necessarily the only explanation for what that is. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no perfectly kind of disambiguating way to distinguish what, you know, the, the, to my mind as a, you know, and as an experimentalist, uh, uh, the, the definitive experiment would be for someone to come up with a way to determine what it would mean to interact with another, quote unquote, another universe, right? And if that's the case, then I think that if someone were able to, number one, formulate what I mean by that in a concrete way, number two, propose an experiment, a concrete experiment that could be done to test that, and number three, perform that experiment, then I, I think I would be able to have my answer. However, I don't even know what that necessarily means. Like imagine, you know, if, if, if I postulate that there's some space-time entity, some sort of like black hole or, you know, like an Einstein Rosen bridge that I were able to create and then control to be able to point toward, quote unquote, uh, you know, another universe, then what if I, you know, take a ruler from our universe and I stick it through this into the other universe? What if in this other universe, carbon atoms don't exist? Okay, then my ruler is not going to be of much use and my hand is also going to disintegrate too. So, you know, I, I, I think that this still requires some, there, there's still a lot of space for concrete ideas uh, and very kind of disambiguating ideas to be able to, 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 to test this idea. I'm, I'm always, I, I'm always on the lookout for new ideas though. And so if, if there's more that you know about that are beyond what I know, I'm happy to hear them. Well, it's just one of those things, the fine tuning, but also the anisotropy of the universe, these very, very minor temperature differences in the CMB that we see. Yeah. It kept this from being essentially a lattice of hydrogen atoms, equidistant <laughs> hydrogen atoms. Yeah. And yeah. that's one of the other things that that admittedly spooks me. I'm not suggesting anything with that. I'm just like, why did that happen? Where did these minute temperature differences come from? And add inflation with that where everything was exceeding the speed of light. <laughs> Wait a minute, <laughs> something changed. <laughs> and that those are the things that, that those are the those are the things that don't keep me up at night but put me to sleep at night <laughs> thinking about. Well, if that's what you're talking about, by spook me or, you know, then there's a large number of those things that I, I, I would use the words endlessly fascinate because those are the things that are, you know, I'm always I'm always thinking about those in the back of my head. They're, you know, I always I have about like 10 or 20 different mental threads that are always going full speed ahead and I'm just concentrating on one at the moment, you know, for whatever it happens to be. And there's always a handful of those in the background too, thinking about these ideas. And I, I agree with you, you know, this notion of, you know, the, the fact that we, the, the 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 you know the almost the almost complete homogeneity of the CMB in all directions being big evidence for you know inflation because again the large scale fluctuations which have been quantum fluctuations back in the day had to have been you know basically washed out by the fact that we expanded at such an enormous rate right at the moment of inflation but then you start to see these little deviations and you start to think okay wait a minute what does that mean yeah i agree with you and if we're talking about things like that of course i am also i'm always always endlessly fascinated and of course not not jealous but also 
envious or I'm, I'm sad that I don't have seven or 10 different lifetimes to fully study different things, right? Because one of them that I would do is, of course, you know, astronomy, where these people are looking for large scale structures that we don't currently have explanation for. So, of course, you know, everyone saw in the news, whatever it was last week or the week before, there was this uh, another announcement of a big ring of galaxies or something like that. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? Uh, that's just fan- I, I love these enormous large scale structures that we see. Yeah. There's a lot of those things that, like you say, not necessarily keep me up at night, but always occupy the constantly sort of curious, you know, eight-year-old part of my brain. Me too. And the recent one that did that for me was the highly energetic particle, (laughs) the Amaterasu particle hitting Earth's atmosphere and being detected Mm. from the direction of a cosmic void. What is that? <laughs> James, we are out of time and I, I, we got to do this again. This was really fun and very captivating for me. I had a fantastic time too. I'm more than happy to come back because uh, as, as you know, we have just discovered, uh, there's plenty to talk about. <laughs> 10 more shows, man. 10 more sh- or more or more. Fantastic. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.